So the theme of our service today is mission, putting our passion into practice. And at the annual meeting later on, I'm going to uh, share with you the, where we've got to with the mission statement of the church, what we want to have as our, our mission statement, who we are as a church community. So that as you tell others about the church that you're part of, it will be clearer that you can say, these are the things that we're passionate about. These things we're excited about. These are the things that actually motivate us in our Christian faith. So for some time, I've been going to look at this passage from John chapter, uh, Luke chapter 10. But um, I was really struck by the beginning of Luke chapter 9. So I thought we'd just have a quick look at that. And uh, this paragraph where... Jesus calls the 12 to him, his 12 disciples. We know who they are. And he gives them, it says in scripture here, power and authority. Great phrase. Power and authority, yeah, to drive out demons and cure diseases. And then what did he do? He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He called the twelve to himself, he gave them power authority, and he sent them out. And he sent them out saying, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. And then if you're not made welcome, that wonderful phrase, shake the dust off your feet. So they set out and they went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. Great sense, isn't it, of Jesus commissioning and, and purposefully sending his close 12 out. Then we come to Luke chapter 10. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go to. That's interesting. Slightly different, subtly different. He's moved on from this is the responsibility of just my 12 disciples into this is a wider responsibility of more people. And depending on your version of the Bible, uh, you will find that it either says 72 or it says 70. Now, what's very interesting about that is if you were to turn back to Numbers chapter 11, which is on page 148 of this version of the church Bible, page 148, Numbers chapter 11. And, and it might be tempting to think, well, Jesus, he, he sent out his 12 disciples. So now he thinks, oh, I, I'm going to widen this slightly. So, oh, I know uh, there's 70 of you there. Let, let's... Um, uh, I know, I'll just, I'll just pick this nearest 70. Well, maybe if we read this bit of numbers, we'll realise it perhaps wasn't quite as random as it might sound. Numbers chapter 11, verse 16, the Lord said to Moses, aha, Jesus is bringing Moses into the question. Bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Make them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take of the spirit that is on you and put the spirit on them. They will help you carry the burden of the people so that you will not have to carry it alone. Fantastic, isn't that? And I just sense that as Jesus says, you 70, I'm going to send you out now, this is ringing in religious Jews' ears the idea that, ah, 70, Moses, 70, the Spirit. And the Spirit, the power, the insights that Moses had is to go on to those who he is now commissioning and sending out. Sending out. And they're to be sent out. And we don't know exactly, but if you look at verse 26... However, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, the 70, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the spirit also rested on them and they prophesied in the camp. Um, th there's a suggestion possibly 
that the 70 or 72, the 70 is clearly linked with this action of Moses. And the, if it's 72, it just might re refer to those two who, as it were, get an extra special mention. But I don't think that's terribly important. What is important is that sense that Jesus is repeating what Moses has already done. You are my followers. You are the ones I'm commissioning to go out and to do this work in my name and in my power. And he sent them out. Now, can I just say, and I, I know this because I was reading this passage with a couple of others earlier this week, and um, we got into thinking about, oh, what would it be like today? And, you know, imagine somebody coming into the middle of Terfuren and, you know, and the very simple question, how would everyone know? Well, let's just, let's just wind back 2,000 years. We're talking about a world that's very different from today's world. I'm saying the obvious. But um, 2,000 years ago, according to Wikipedia, some 170 million people lived on the earth. That's all. That is the sum total of something like the United Kingdom population plus France plus Germany. That's it. Yeah? Yeah? in the whole of the world. And even that figure is not totally accurate because I don't know how they get to a figure like that, yeah? It's that sort of figure. Today, there are something like 7.5 billion people living on the earth. So when Jesus sends people out into the towns and villages of Galilee, of Palestine, it's much more like, I don't know, have you ever been to rural Africa? And I don't just mean a little village on the edge of Nairobi. I mean leaving a place like Accra or Nairobi or Khartoum and driving for a day. And then when you get there, discovering that you're arriving at a church with a group of people on a, on a visit maybe, and you get there and the pastor comes to visit you and you look around and there's a, the church there and there's a couple of other buildings. You think, where's the village? And you discover that the village is actually around because people own land. And the village consists of maybe 100 people or so, and it's scattered. But that once you arrive, in the most extraordinary sort of way, and you think, well, how does anybody know I'm here? And you sit down, and you're given some refreshments, and gradually people start arriving, <laughs> as if by magic, yeah? Yeah. Uh, these days, people get their telephones out and say, oh, he's come, you better turn up, yeah? But in, in the good old days, you know, actually, it, it just permeated through. So, you know, the person arrived in Terfuren, and extraordinarily, the message gets through to Diceberg, and the guy, somebody comes down, a family come down to meet this special visitor to Terfuren. It's much more that sort of picture that we need to have in our mind as we see these people being sent out by the Lord Jesus to be bringers of good news. So they go out. They're appointed by Jesus. Interestingly, that word, rather than given power and authority, they're appointed, but clearly they're given authority. But do you notice he sends them out two by two? I think that's really important. And he sends them ahead of him to every town and village that he was going to go to. The disciples are sent out on a mission to go and do their stuff in Jesus' name. These next group of people, as it were, are chosen, appointed, and sent out together. Just go and see what happens. Go and try it. I'm going to these villages. Go, go and warm them up. Yeah, go and drop some ideas into people's minds that this, this guy called Jesus is around. This is his teaching. This is what it's about. This is where it's going. You might be interested. Come and listen to him in a couple of days' time. Yeah? It's a bit like the, you know, the, I don't know if you've ever been in France on holiday in those um, uh, seaside resorts when the um, caravans pitch up all the time with the circuses. Yeah, and you find these circus placards all over the place. Yeah? And then you see in a, in a little square or something... Um, the caravans coming together and a tent being pitched up and all that. Um, we've had great fun over the years going to those sort of little impromptu circuses and stuff. But, but there's a bit of publicity going on. So Jesus is using these people to go and prepare the way. Why is that? Next slide, please. Because 
in Luke chapter 10 and verse 5, we read these amazing words. Sorry, it's not for, uh, 2, verse 2. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. And I wonder if we, actually as Christian people, really believe that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Do we really believe that, as it were, out there, there are a lot of people who are interested in things of the Spirit, who are interested in finding out about God, who are interested in taking an opportunity to, to mull over what it really means to be human, what a Christian understanding really is. They've got their own ideas about church, about how you do church, but actually give people an opportunity to talk. Well, I was only speaking with a woman earlier this week. We got talking about our church weekend away. And I'm thinking, how do I tell her about the church weekend away? It was a great thing, etc., etc. And I was thinking, yeah, actually, the Ten Commandments is really interesting. The Ten Commandments. And I was saying, well, we've, we've um, she's got a vaguely religious background, but she's American, very anti-religion for all sort of good reasons in her mind, you know. And um, I was saying, we, we've been doing this series for a month or so on the Ten Commandments. And you can see her sort of look at us. I said, oh, you know, all that stuff where it feels like God says, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't make a mess of your life, you know, don't murder, all that sort of stuff, yeah? And she, she nodded, said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I said it's really interesting, actually, because um, we, uh, we had this guy who sort of led us off in the whole thing, and um, she knows I'm the minister here. I said, uh, but Patrick, you know, he started us off, and he, he started with this idea that the commandments were called words of life. You could see her going, oh, yeah. And, and that they were words of wisdom, mm. words of freedom. And you, you could see her sort of thinking, oh, what's this about, yeah? And then I said, and there were words of love. And her shoulders visibly dropped. And you could see her sort of saying, gosh, I, I've never thought of it like that before. And... Unfortunately, we were with some other people and then that conversation got caught. But I was really pleased to have been able just to drop a little thought into her mind about a different way of looking at something. A different way of how we as Christian people begin to see things. And I thought, you know, the harvest is great. There are many, many people out there who would love the opportunity just to sort of chew things over, talk about I mean, that's why Jesus, of course, spent so much time sitting at tables, talking with people, because that's where we relax. And, and I'll tell you, it was with a glass of wine over food that this lady and I had this conversation. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So Jesus says, next slide, says, go, go, verse, uh, verse three. And he says, go. And then he says this extraordinary thing. I'm sending you out like lambs amongst wolves. Now, I think, I realised, I think for a long time, Christian people have thought, we ought to go out there and uh, we'll share our faith. Oh, they're not really interested. Jesus says to the 70, I'm sending you out like lambs amongst wolves. Yeah, it's not easy. That's how it is. Yeah. What, why should it be? And I think what Christian people do today is we curl up and say, oh, therefore, it's not worth doing or, or therefore oh, they won't be interested. I'm not going to look for an opportunity. I'm not going to pray for an opportunity because it's too difficult. It's always been difficult. That's how it is. But Jesus' mission and Jesus commissions and appoints us to go and be those who have a passion to share him and his mission. Then he says this great thing, don't take purse, bag or sandals. And you remember he told his, um, he told his uh, 12 to take no staff, no bread, no money, no extra tunic either. Yeah, just, just go out. What he's saying is be reliant on the other people who are there and actually don't sort of be so prepared yourself so cocooned in what you do, so safe that you don't need to take any risks. That's what that is actually about. There to go, 
And they're going to go and stay in houses, we'll discover. We'll come on to that in a moment. But they're going to go and stay in houses where they're made welcome. And they're going to be given food and drink. But actually, they're not going to rely on their own credit cards and phones and everything else that's going to help get them out of that situation. They're going to go and trust in God. Now, that is a bit radical, and we're not very good at... I'm not very good at doing that, yeah? It's so much easier to trust in my iPhone and in my own intuitiveness, yeah? And in my own having already booked a hotel in the particular place I'm going to go ahead. There's a man called Daniel Cousins who many years ago started something called... what was actually originally called the Walk of a Thousand Men, and his vision was to get a thousand men from churches in Britain to be involved in mission, walking around Britain, taking the good news from place to place. And it started by them walking, I think it was around Cornwall, going to Cornwall and and walking around Cornwall and going from place to place. Now, the churches were involved, and what happened was the churches would receive these men and they'd carry backpacks, they'd carry a sleeping bag, and they'd have about 150 a day. That was all. No phones, no credit cards. And they were to be dependent on the welcome that they were given. Now, having said that, it was an organised way of doing missions. The churches were involved, and you'd either stay in the church hall or in people's homes. Just occasionally, it didn't work out. That's when you depended on prayer, didn't it? Yeah? But actually, you were going there, you were unsure as to how the week was going to work out, where you would go from place to place. But it was echoing this way of really throwing yourself on God rather than our own devices, and it's, there's something very wonderful and very powerful about that, indeed, for us even today. So when the 70, when the 72 came anywhere, they were to enter a house. And the first words they were to say was, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace, says Jesus, is there, your peace will rest on them. Peace to this house. I wonder if it's something that we ought to get into more and more, that as we go into people's homes, and I, and I hope we do, though I fear these days less and less people cross the thresholds of other people's homes, but this idea of peace to this house, peace to the people who are there. And Jesus says, if it's a home of peace, you'll be made welcome. You'll be made welcome and you'll be able to stay there. If it's not a home of peace, you'll sense that in your heart. You'll sense that and your peace will return to you. He then says, stay in that house, eating and drinking. You see, it's very tempting. Uh, Mark and um, Alex live opposite us. And, uh, you know, you can imagine the scenario, can't you? Somebody's come and we've made them welcome, Anne and I. And uh, so, you know, they get bean stew from us, yeah? And a bit of, bit of cold water. And Alex is sort of, cooking sort of marvellous cordon bleu cooking that she does across the way and Mark's popping the corks of the best wine that he's got in his cellar, you know. And the poor person staying with us, you know, has just had a bit of beans and still feeling a bit hungry and goes out and thinks, whoa, that smells nice, yeah. Wonderful temptation sort of to go and knock on the door. Any chance I could come and, come and stay and, and eat with you, please, yeah. But what Jesus is saying is, no, 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 you've been made welcome in this place. Stay there. Don't chase after food. That's not, you're there on a mission. You're there to be sharing the good news. You're not there to fill your belly and eat, drink the best wine you can get hold of. You're actually there sent in my name to speak of me. And if you're made welcome, stay there. You're made welcome, eat and drink. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. I think this is a fascinating bit. You've been made welcome. Things are going well. They're listening to you. Jesus hasn't said that um, everybody's sort of become Christ followers or anything like that. But there's just that sense of an openness to what's going on, to, to, to to the words of Christ. And the phrase is, the kingdom of God is near you. Whereas, and hear these words, if you're not made welcome, what do you do? You enter a town, you're not welcomed. Go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet, we wipe off against you. But be sure to say this too. The kingdom of God is near. 
Do you hear the difference? Where the person has been made welcome, where there's a person of peace, where there's a discussion about these things, the kingdom of God is near you. You're beginning to get what God's kingdom is all about. But where we're not made welcome, actually the words are, just remember folks, the kingdom of God is near. And actually the implicit phrase is, and what are you doing about getting ready for it? Yeah, You haven't made me, one of God's messengers, welcome. What actually are you doing to get ready for this kingdom of God that is near? Let's go on to the next slide, please. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Yeah? Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Isn't that lovely? When we go, when we speak of Christ, people are listening, as it were, to Christ himself. But if we're rejected, actually we need to remember it's not just us that's being rejected. It's Christ himself that is being rejected. And if they reject him, they're rejecting God Almighty himself who sent him. So the 72, we hear, returned with joy. They were really excited because what had happened was great things had happened. Verse 17, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions to overcome all the power of the enemy. Jesus says, to you and to me. Next slide, please. Jesus says to you and to me, we are given, uh, next slide, please. We are given authority, just as he has authority in his battle with evil, that we remember particularly in Lent as he battles with the devil, those three temptations particularly. We are given this authority and we are promised that nothing will harm us. But the temptation is of God's people is we then get so excited at the wonderful things that are happening because we're being faithful. Isn't this marvellous? And Jesus then drills down into these 72. He drills into the hearts and said, what's really important? What really matters? That when you went and preached in Terfur and people got excited that, that, that a few people were healed and things like that. No, 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 no. What's really important? What's really important is that you rejoice, that you know, that you believe that your names are written in heaven. I wonder sometimes if as Christian people, we don't look for opportunities to share our faith because actually we don't really believe that our names are written in heaven. We don't really trust that we've been called and chosen, that we don't really believe that actually what we know as good news is such good news that we want to share it with everyone else around us. Let's go on to the very last slide, please. So what does this mean to us today? What does the very last slide, please? What does this mean for us today? I think we're reminded that just as Moses called and needed people to take the message on, Take God's power on, as it were, from him. Jesus does the same with these followers. Take this power, be filled with the Spirit, be equipped, be ready to go out. Actually, we're called as well to go. It is so tempting to think we're going to be here, a nice, welcoming church. We do all we can to make people feel welcome. But we depend on them, first of all, making the effort to get here. I think we really need to go out and encourage and call. I think it's very interesting. We're really rather low in numbers today. And what I see missing are the folk, some of the folk who are, um, I think, the ones who really need drawing in, who really need encouraging, who really need help in feeling part of church community, of us. And I can't do that because I'm the minister. And I chase people up and it looks like the minister's chasing people up. Where were you on Sunday? It's about us as a church community having relationships with people that rejoices and encourages. Just because people have come here a number of times to church doesn't mean that they understand who Jesus is and what the Christian faith is about. 
just because people worship with us sometimes doesn't mean that they really believe that their hearts, that, 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 that their, their, their names are written in heaven. You know? And actually we need to remember that the, the first mission that we're called to is those who give, the, give us the opportunity. But we're also called not just simply to be passive receivers of those, but actively to go. Jesus says go. And then he says go two by two. It's not just about going on our own. It's not just all about me and whether I can convert people, yeah? It's about actually, it's about, in my case, me and Anne as a married couple, maybe. Or it's about me and Nathan as colleagues at work, as it were, talking to people, yeah? Not as ministers, but as colleagues at work, you know? It's about, you know, somebody, I can think of somebody here who's, who's, who's got a colleague at work who they pray with, you know? And actually then able to sort of minister to, to share the good news with, to, to be going out, as it were, to others at work or others at the clubs that we're part of, or whatever it is, yeah? It, we don't do it ourselves and in our own strength. And it's not simply people from St. Paul's. It's Christian people from whichever churches they come from. Because as Jesus said, there's a massive harvest. There's a plentiful harvest. But so few of us do anything about it. It was true then. And I actually fear it's true today. And what do we look for? Very simply. Very simply. We look for people like that woman I spoke to the other day and we look for opportunities just to simply drop in thoughts and ideas that give an opportunity for a conversation to move people on from where they are. I believe that woman is a person of peace and I believe that gently there is a little conversation that is potentially beginning to start with her. And thankfully, there will be other Christian people that she knows. It doesn't all depend on me. It's on other people she meets at work and in other situations who throw ideas into her as well, that gradually, step by step. We had a meeting last night about, about the ball and what happens post the ball. And uh, very interesting because I think there are still some people that think that we go to one event, like the gingerbread event or something like that, or, or to, to fun tots, and we go a couple of times, and then we suddenly come to church. No, 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 no. I mean, it'd be great if that's how it worked. But in most cases, life is far more complicated, and people need to draw around them a whole series of warm, welcoming, encouraging, blessing experiences of Christ, of his church, of his message, of his meaning, of his purpose. That's the mission. And only gradually then will people find themselves more drawn towards worship, more drawn towards the word, more drawn towards his people. And it's a slow, slow process. I had an experience of coming to faith and in many ways I turned around very quickly. But I'd had 18 years of being brought up in a Christian family. All the background was there. So that when I drifted away from church life for 10 years, actually coming back wasn't that difficult. I got it. I understood it. So many people today have no background at all of faith, of Christian faith. And in fact, if we talk about religious faith today, you know, I bet if you interviewed a lot of people in Britain today and about religious faith, they talk about that guy who did the shootings in London, in Westminster, on Wednesday. We believe in a God of love, a God of peace, a God who writes our names in heaven and calls us to share in his mission, to go out in his power and his strength and trust the message that we have. Should we go and do it? Amen.